Okay, today we're going to take a look at the version of the Atwood machine which seems to be the darling child of every physics book ever. And that is just a block sitting on a horizontal surface. We take a light string, run it over a pulley, and run that string down to a hanging block. You can't pick up a physics book without finding this problem sitting somewhere in it. But what we're going to do today is we're going to look at this problem uh, in as realistic of a situation as we can. We're going to put some mass on this pulley right here. We're going to put some friction between the block and the surface here. Uh, and really what that means is if you can do this problem, you are going to be able to work out any Atwood machine that you see that's set up like this because it only gets simpler from here. So the first thing we're going to need to work out here with this is finding out if this system is even going to move. Uh, if there's enough friction between this block and the surface here, nothing's going to happen. And so what I want to go through and do is take a look at a free body diagram showing all the forces acting in this system. And uh, let's see what happens. Starting with this block right here. We know there's gravity acting downward on the block. And we know because this is on a level surface, there's going to be a normal force upward that is equal in magnitude to that force by gravity. Now, this block right here is going to have the string pulling it to the right. So we're going to show that string acting to the right. And lastly, on this block, we're going to see the friction force. Now, this block can only ever be pulled to the right, so that means friction is going to always be to the left. Moving on to this block down here. We know gravity is going to be pulling down on the block. And the tension in the string is going to be pulling up. Now, if this pulley had no mass, that would be the end of the story here with forces. And we could just go about our merry way solving this problem, figuring out whether or not the system is going to move. But we also have this pulley right here. Now, yes, the axle is frictionless, but there's also forces acting on the pulley. I want you to realize the string is pulling down on the pulley here and to the left there. Now, the first thing we're going to do in this problem is solve for whether or not the system is going to accelerate. So in order to determine whether or not the system is going to accelerate, I want to look at the forces which are acting externally on the system. When I say forces acting externally on the system, I mean gravity. That's an outside force acting on the system, which is the two blocks and the pulley. Uh, the normal force is an external force. Friction is an external force. Tension is an internal force. You'll see that tension acts in one direction here and then cancels itself out acting in the opposite direction there. Same thing up here. So when I say external forces, basically I mean all the forces except for the tension in the string. Now, you can see the gravity or the force by gravity on this block is canceling itself out with the normal force. So really what we have here in this problem is this force by gravity fighting this friction force. And if this force by gravity can overcome the friction force, well then the system is going to move. And in order to show this as some sort of equality, what I want to do is establish a positive direction in this problem. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that anything which is trying to make this pulley rotate clockwise is in the positive direction. So if we were to pull down on this block, that would be a pull in the positive direction. Uh, if we were to pull to the left on this block over here, that would be pulling in the negative direction. This is just a way to keep our, our forces, and whether they're contributing to the motion of the system or fighting the motion of the system, straight. So what you'll see is we have a positive force here by M2G that's pulling this downward in the positive direction, and friction is acting in the negative direction. So in coming up with a condition for the acceleration of this system, we get if this force which is competing with friction, is greater than friction, then the system will accelerate. I want to expand out this friction term just a little bit. I'm going to say the friction term, remember, friction is mu fn. So if m2g is greater than mu fn, then we'll see acceleration. Now, assuming we're starting this from rest, that would mean we have to overcome static friction. Uh, if this system was already in motion, then we'd be talking about kinetic friction here. So, what we have here is an expression. If we meet this term, then acceleration will be non-zero. The next thing I want to do is, assuming we meet this condition for motion, 
interact with machine, I want to solve for the actual linear acceleration of this block downward, which is also going to be the horizontal acceleration of this block to the right. Now there's a variety of methods that we can choose from to solve for the acceleration of this system. I'm going to go through and do this using energy. I seem to prefer energy. This can also be done with force, but that's not what we're doing today. Maybe some other time. Uh, so solving this using energy. What we're going to do is we're going to treat all three of these objects as though they're a, a system with which we're concerned, and we're going to apply the work energy theorem to those objects. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the work energy theorem, which I've written here, just click up there to see where it comes from. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this mechanical situation or this apparatus to the work energy theorem. And that will eventually lead us to the acceleration of the system. And I'll show you how. I want to go through and look at each of these five terms independently. First, let's start with the kinetic energy. Now, the initial kinetic energy of this entire system is zero because it starts at rest. Nothing's moving. And what I also want to do is go through and say everything starts at an initial height of zero. And I know that seems a little bit strange. If I say this block is starting at a height of zero, how can this block start at a height of zero? And really what I want to look at is largely a change in potential energy. When I look at a shift from initial to final potentials, realize we're just talking about a change in potential. So I'm going to look at everything as though it started at a height of zero and finishes at some other height. Now our non-conservative work term, this is going to be a little bit interesting here. There is in fact non-conservative work done in this problem. That is, some force is going to take energy away from the system. And in this case, that is friction. So to generate a function for a non-conservative work, what I want to do is look at the work by friction. Now we know work is going to be force times displacement in this case. Uh, so we're going to have a friction force that is going to be mu m1g. And this is our friction force multiplied by a displacement. Now the question comes up, how far are we going to let things move? So what I want to do is I want to let these blocks move forward some distance d. It could be any distance d, it's just going to be a variable. You'll find it cancels out later on. So we're going to let this block move down some distance d, and this block move forward some distance d. So going back to our non-conservative work term, we've got a friction force multiplied by a displacement. Now it's important to be very specific in here. When this block moves forward, it's sliding against the ground, so we have kinetic friction. Additionally, it's important to realize the friction is backwards, yet the displacement is forward. So our work term is going to be negative. Ultimately, this is simply telling us that friction is robbing the system of energy. It is taking energy away. Now, moving on to our final kinetic energy, I actually want to skip over kinetic energy for a moment and look at final potential. The final potential is going to be really just the shift in potential of each of our three objects. Now this block right here is going to move horizontally, so it will have no change in potential. It started at a height of zero and it finishes at a height of zero. Our pulley is going to be free to rotate, but it's not going to move linearly in any direction, so it will have no change in gravitational potential. But last we have this block right here. This block M2 is going to move down some distance, D. So if it starts at some initial height of zero, it will finish at a height of negative d. That will give us a final potential of the weight of the block, m2g, times its final height, which is negative d. It's negative because it moved down. And I know that seems odd because we were saying earlier that down was going to be the positive direction here. But realize when we're dealing with energy and gravitational potential energy, up is positive and down is negative regardless of what we chose to say was a positive direction here. Uh, and now I want to take a look at the final kinetic. Now, looking at this block right here, as it is drug to the right, accelerating at some rate A, which we're trying to solve for, over this distance D, it's going to speed up. And so by the time it's traveled to the right, some distance D, it's going to be traveling at some velocity. I'm just going to call that V. And as this block moves downward, 
it's going to accelerate at this rate a so by the time it's moved downward it will be traveling downward at the same speed which this block will be moving to the right so again we're going to call it v so in generating a function for our kinetic energies i want to look at each block when this system is moving right at this instant where the blocks are moving downward and over at v starting with this block it's going to have a kinetic energy one half m1 v squared this block right here one half m2 v squared now again if this pulley had no mass we could stop right here but we also have to throw in the kinetic energy of this pulley which is rotating now realize, the pulley itself is not moving to the left or the right, and it's not moving up or down, it's simply rotating. But realize, as an object rotates, it has kinetic energy. So this is going to be the kinetic energy of the disk. And I want to take a closer look at this term right here. The kinetic energy of the disk, and yes, I spelled disk with a C, is going to be equal to the kinetic energy of a rotating body. That's one half I, in this case of a disc, times its angular velocity squared. Now we know the inertia of a disc is one half mass times a disc's radius squared. Now I call this MP for the mass of the pulley. So I'll say that's the mass of the pulley right here. And it has some radius r as outlined here if you want to see how this formula is derived just click up here now if we sub this in here we're going to wind up with first a stupid squiggly line because i wrote down the wrong thing and then this uh, we have to be really careful with this uh, it's one half i omega squared be super careful when you're dealing with a disc because you wind up with a one half sitting in here twice so the kinetic energy of a disk is this term right here. And if we sub this in right here, we're going to wind up with a problem. And that is we have velocities. These are tangential or linear velocities here and an angular velocity here. And so what we need to do is we need to relate the angular velocity of this pulley to the linear velocity of these two blocks. Now once you realize V is equal to r omega, where v is the tangential velocity of the edge of the pulley, and omega is its angular velocity. Well, since the string is unable to slide against the edge of the pulley, the downward velocity of this block is going to be equivalent to the tangential velocity of the edge of the pulley. So I can say this v, the tangential velocity of the pulley, is the same as the linear velocity or translational velocity of the two blocks. So putting all this together, we get the final kinetic energy of everything. We get this, which can be cleaned up and rearranged into this, which looks much cleaner. Now remember, we're gonna take this, this kinetic energy, this final potential and non-conservative work term and put them all into our work energy theorem. Now we have this term here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange this uh, so that we have v squared all by itself on one side of the equal sign. So now to make the last leap and get to acceleration from velocity, I know it's tempting to take the derivative, but we're not going to do that. We're going to use the kinematics. And what I want to use, I'll write it over here, is the kinematic equation vf squared equals vi squared plus 2ad. Realize what we've been calling V is actually the final velocity and the initial velocity was zero So the final velocity in this problem squared is equal to two times the acceleration multiplied by the displacement So I'm going to put that right here Now if we want to solve for the actual acceleration, you'll see we get some nice cancellation here the D cancels out on both sides and this two cancels out with this one half right here and we're left with this right here. So here we have an expression for the acceleration of this system as a function 
of all the values which have been given to us in the problem. So provided we meet this condition where the blocks will accelerate, we will see this acceleration. Now the last thing I want to point out here with this, uh, and it really wasn't an issue as we went through and solved this using energy, is this issue with the tensions here. The way I've shown this, I said there was a tension over here, uh, T, and a tension over here, T. And while our energy method basically ignored the tensions altogether, if you were to look at this through the lens of force, you'd have to account for the fact that the tension over here, which I'm going to say is T1 because it's connected to block 1, is not the same as the tension over here. I'll call it T2 because it's connected to block 2. It can't be the same because, well, if they were the same, this pulley would have no net torque on it and therefore would not have a net acceleration. Like I said, though, it wasn't an issue in this method of, of solving the problem, but I would hate for you to go off into the world thinking the two tensions had to be the same in this problem. So this is the horizontal Atwood machine, including both friction and pulley mass. And on that note, that's all for now. Physics.